Beautiful translation it describes some of the characteristics and activities of Lord Chaitanya. Mm. <clears throat> His complexion is of the hue of fresh cream tinge with kumkum. He is ever fresh Cupid who shoots arrows of newly blossoming flowers. He bears newer and newer moods of emotional ecstasy. He is fond of performing novel dances. He makes ever new jokes that cause much laughter. His brilliant luster is like freshly cast gold. I bow down to Goda, the beautiful son of Mother Sachi. <clears throat> he is endowed with the ever fresh love of Godhead. His radiant luster is like the color of fresh butter. His fresh attire is arranged in ever new fashions. He relishes ever new mellows of love for Krishna. He shines in ninefold new ways while executing the ninefold process of devotional service. He is permeated with a most auspicious loving nature. I bow down to Goda, the beautiful son of Mother Sachi. He is absorbed in devotion to Sri Hari. He maintains the chanting of the names of Hari. While chanting, he counts the holy names on the fingers of his hands. He is addicted to the names of Hari. He always has tears of love welling in his eyes. I bow down to Goda, the beautiful son of Mother Sachi. <clears throat> he is always removing the suffering of material existence for mankind. He is the goal of life for persons who are dedicated to their own supreme interest. He aspires men to become like honeybees, eager for the honey of Krishna Prem. He removes the burning fever of the material world. I bow down to Goda, the beautiful son of Mother Sachi. He who motivates pure devotional service unto himself, who is most attractive to his beloved servitors, by his dramatic dancing, 
He exhibits the characteristics of the king of the paramours. He causes the mind of beautiful young village girls to dance. I bow down to Goda, the beautiful son of Mother Sachi. He plays cartos as his throat emits sweet melodious sounds and the vibrant notes of the vena are softly played. He thus inspires the devotees to perform dramatic dancing that is infused with aspects of his own devotional service. I bow down to Goda, the beautiful son of Mother Sachi. He is accompanied by the Sankraton movement, which is the religious practice for the age of Kali. He is the son of Nanda Maharaj, come again. He is the extraordinary brilliant ornament of the earth. His preaching mood is suitably adapted for the cycle of birth and death. His consciousness is fixed in meditation on his own form of Krishna. He is always accompanied by this transcendental boat. I bow down to Goda. I bow down to the beautiful son of Mother Sachi. His eyes, the soles of his feet, and his clothing are reddish like the color that heralds the rising sun. As he utters his own names, his voice falters. He awakens a sweet flavor of life throughout the universe. I bow down to Goda, the beautiful son of Mother Sachi. That is by Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. <clears throat> Okay. Oh yeah, I think I need this, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, sir. I get claustrophobia with this thing, but anyway. <laughs> okay, so we'll read from one verse from the fifth canto, eighteenth chapter, the residence of Jumbo Dweep off of prayers. Mm -hmm. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So uh, it's in the prose, so we'll do the word for word. Om, Om, O Lord, Lord. Namaha, Namaha, respectful obeisances, Bhagavate, unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Matra Tattva Lingaya, who is understood in truth by different mantras, Yagya, in the form of an animal, I'm sorry, in the form of animal sacrifices. Kratave, and animal sacrifices. Mahadwara, great sacrifices. Avyayavaya, whose limbs and bodily parts. Mahapurushaya, Mahapurushaya unto, the unto the Supreme Person. Namaha, Namaha respectful, obeisances. respectful obeisances. Karma Suklaya, <laughs> who purifies the fruit of activities <laughs> of the living entities. <laughs> Triyugaya, <laughs> unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Who is filled with six opulences and who appears in three yugas, remaining concealed in the fourth yuga. Namaha, my respectful obeisances. Te unto you. Translation O oh Lord. We offer our respectful obeisances unto you as the gigantic person. Simply by chanting mantras, we shall be able to understand you fully. You are yagya, sacrifice, and you are the kratu, ritual. Therefore, all of the ritualistic ceremonies of sacrifice are part of your transcendental body, and you are the only enjoyer of all sacrifices. Your form is composed of transcendental goodness, 
you are known as Tri Yuga because in Kali Yuga you appear as a concealed incarnation and because you always fully possess the three pairs of opulences. <coughs> Srila Prabhupada's short purport, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the incarnation for the age of Kali, as confirmed in many places throughout the Puranas, the, Bhag the Mahabhar, Srimad Bhagavatam, and the Upanishads. The summary of his appearance is given in Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya 699 as follows. Kali Yuga Lila Avatar Nakara Bhagavan Atevatri Yuga Kari Kahitara Nama. In this age of Kali, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Bhagavan, does not appear as a Lila Avatar, an incarnation to develop, display pastimes. Therefore, he is known as Tri Yuga. Unlike other incarnations, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appears in this age of Kali as a devotee of the Lord. He is therefore called a concealed incarnation's Chana avatar. Omigyan timidanda siya gyana jana salakaya chaksun militam yena tasmai shri guruvena maha nama om vishnu vadaya krishna prasthaya bhutale shri bhakti bhakti vedanta swami niti namine namaste saraswati deve gaudavani pacharine nirvase sasunyavani pasyatya de satarine anchakalpa tarubhisya Kripa Sindhu Pei Bacha Petitanam Pavane Bio Vaishnave Bio Namaho Namaha Ajanu Lumpita Bujo Kanakamatato Sankirtanai Papitaro Kamalaya Takso Vishwambaro Dvijabaro Yuga Dharma Falo Vande Jagapriyakaro Karuna Avataro Vande Shri Krishna Chaitanya Nityanando Sanodido Goro Daya Pushpan Banto Chitta Sando Tamo Nudo Panchatadva Makam Krishnam Bhakta Rupa Svarupakam Bhakta Avatara Bhakta Kyam Namami Bhakti Shaktikam Jai Sri Krishna Jaitanya Prabhu Dityananda Sri Advaita Gadahar Sivasadi Hora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So in every subject matter within the uh, scriptures that center around the personality of Godhead, there are two aspects of that subject matter. One is called Tattva and the other one is called Lila. Before we can really understand Lila cor correctly, we have to have a working knowledge of Tattva. That's why you'll see in the Srimad Bhagavatam, when you take, you note how the verses are, are structured in a systematic way. Before you get to Krishna's pastimes in the 10th canto, the first and second canto gives a very deep and very intricate explanations of the philosophy centered around the identity and the activity or the purpose of the activity of the Supreme Personality of God, and that's called Tattva. So that's why it's placed first, because people will misunderstand Leela and think Leela is like what we do. We see, we hear about the Lord's activities, and they look very similar to the activities of the conditioned souls in the material world. But that's just from the external point of view. There's nothing similar about them. Nothing. Because they're on a whole completely different level of existence and the whole mood of the activity is completely opposite of the material mood. So in order to uh, get a correct, at least understand, at least to a certain degree, the activities of the Lord, that's why the 10th canto was placed towards the end of the Bhagavatam and not at the beginning. And same with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also, because he is, he is the Bhagavatam personified. He is non-different than Srimad Bhagavatam because he is Krishna himself. But to understand Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, you have to understand a little bit about who is he. Therefore, in the uh, 
seventh chapter, it gives a little, this book doesn't go up to the seventh, it only goes to the sixth, okay? It explains pancha tattva makam krishnam bhakta rupa sarupakam bhakta avataram bhakti akyam namami bhakti shakti kam. So the Lord, Lord is considered to be incarnation and then there is expansion and then there is the uh, um, bhakta avatar which is uh, advaita and then bhakti shakti and that is gadahar bhakti kyam the devotee that is srivas so this is the different manifestations of the absolute truth in five different features of that same absolute truth this sounds a little technical and you might find it a little boring but it's actually interesting because it helps us to understand what is the nature of the supreme lord and how he exists within his spiritual essence. Um, therefore, we, we describe these things as a foundation for understanding his, his activities. Because it's mentioned here that there are five aspects to the absolute truth. Sometimes we say God is one, but in one particular lecture by Srila Prabhupada, he said, God is five, <laughs> not one. He was kind of uh, defeating the Mayavadi philosophy that God is one and that we're all God and we all, we're all manifested of that one Supreme Lord. But Prabhupada said, no, actually he's not only one, he's five. <laughs> he comes in fe different features of himself and they're all of the same absolute nature. So there's no real difference between any of the five there in spiritual essence. Although, for the sake of function, they play different roles in that, in that spiritual essence in order to carry out the affairs of the spiritual world. It's just it's almost like it's easy to explain, just like if you have a, a president, you have the vice president, and you have the ministers, and you have the different cabinet members, and military personnel so krishna has his entourage also but they're all expansions of himself <laughs> so in that one sense he's not different from him but at the same time he is also different so that once in oneness and different is understood in relationship to the nature of how to approach the absolute truth so sri chaitanya mahaprabhu who is he don't worry about that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is not, <clears throat> he is Krishna, but he's just, he's more than Krishna. Can you actually understand that? <laughs> How can anything be more than Krishna? He is, he's not called avatar. That means one who descends. The word avatar means one who comes down. He is avatari, which means the source of all of the avatars. Why? Because he is Radharani and Krishna in one form. Radha, Radha and Krishna are two, but actually they started off, can, we can't say that, they actually, the essence is that they are one, but at the same time different for the sake of manifesting leelas or personality exchanges or leela. In other words, loving exchanges between the Lord and his internal energy, which is the pleasure potency manifested as Srimati Radharani. So why did Sri Chaitanya, who is Krishna himself, why did he come in that form of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? He did everything when he, he came as as uh, as Krishna in Srimad Bhagavad Gita. Krishna explains and then Bhagavatam is there. All the knowledge is there. So what was the purpose of Mahaprabhu's appearance? That's why he's called Namo Mahavadanaya Krishna Prema Padayate. Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namadi Goda Tristatam. His purpose is mercy. His person's purpose is magnanimity. His purpose is to break out all of the rules and regulations and throw them out. If you can you can actually achieve perfection simply by following this simple process. 
Now, why did he do that? Because when he came as Krishna, what did he do? Sarva Dharma Pradikshijan Mamikam Saranam Vaja Aham Tvam Sarva Papevyo Moksha Yashami Masya Surrender to me. That's the first principle. Surrender. Before you go anywhere, you got to surrender. That's the first step. And then he said, abandon all your ideas on how you can make advancement spiritually. That's what he means, abandon all varieties of religion. That's the meaning of it. Don't think you can do it. You can't. If you surrender to me, take shelter to me, I will guide you, and then you will reach perfection through my guidance. So that's what Krishna said. But people didn't like that. Oh, he's too tough. <laughs> He's making it hard. You know, this is Kali Yuga. We're not so qualified. <laughs> so what are we going to do? He wants complete surrender. Yeah. I'll give him something. So that was the, that, that, and so the Lord actually reflected on that. And he thought, I made it too hard. <laughs> They're not qualified. They can't do it. <laughs> And they won't do it. And so I have to make it easier. So he comes as himself in the form of his own devotee to show personally how he should be worshipped. And it's so easy. Prabhupada said Krishna consciousness is simple but not easy. <laughs> So those two words seem to be similar in one sense. It's simple. Chant Hare Krishna. Any more, any any questions? <laughs> That's simple. And when you feel happy, you know, move that torso in different directions. <laughs> Dance. And when you get hungry, take some prasadam, not too much, and then get up and chant again. And dance again. And then when you get hungry, more prashad. That gives you more energy. Get up, dance again, chant again. Keep doing it. You're back to God. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> In other words, he gave the process so easy, so sublime. So uh, anyone can even, probably even a child can do it. So that's Mahaprabhu. He's so kind. And what is that chanting? It's a glorification of Krishna's names. So why did he manifest that in a very complicated way? In other words, why did he have to appear in so many different, in his form, in order, and also bring a complete entourage in order to inspire that? He could have did it by empowering some personality, some great soul coming from his personal entourage in the spiritual world to do that. But he wanted to demonstrate himself, to show, not only to teach, but to show that here's how you do it. In other words, Prabhupada says when the student, teacher, when the teacher takes the position of the student and teaches the student how to uh, do the lessons given by the teacher, that's the best teaching. Why? Because the teacher knows what the student should be doing. So if he takes the position of a student and shows you from that position how to worship the teacher or how to follow the teacher's instruction, that's the perfect example. That's, that's Mahaprabhu. So he's showing by his own personal example. So he came to taste his own sweetness in the form of his own position as Srimati Radharani. So therefore he, he manifests himself in that way. But he comes for different reasons. Why did he come when he came? Of course, that is the different reasons. There's, there's, it's mentioned in the Chaitanya Charitamrita that there are six reasons why he comes, three internal and three external. We'll get to those in the fourth chapter of this particular section here. Hmm. OK. 
Okay, it says here. It says here. Okay. Okay, I have given the essential meaning of the fourth verse. This incarnation descends to propagate the chanting of the holy name and spread love of God. Although, although this is true, this is but the external reason for the Lord's incarnation. Please hear one other reason, the confidential reasons for the Lord's appearance. Translation of scriptures proclaim that Lord Krishna personally descended to take away the burden of the earth. He says that in Bhagavad Gita, yada yada hi dharmasya, glanir bhavati bharata, abhutanam da dharmasya tadatmanam srijami aham, pavitranayam sadunam, vinasanaya chaduskritam, dharma samstarpanartaryam, sambhavami yuge yuge. He comes for three reasons as he manifests that way. Krishna is mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita. He comes to destroy irreligion in the form of the demons. He kills the demons. He reestablishes religious principles when religious principles go so far down. And he gives pleasure to his devotees by his appearance so his devotees can associate with him and worship him in his personal form. So that is an external reason. But it says here, to take away this burden, however, is not the work of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So though he says he comes, Lord Vishnu is the one who protects the universe. But the time to lift the burden of the world mixed with the time for Lord's incarnation was simultaneous. When the complete Supreme Personality of God had descends, all other incarnations of the Lord meet together within him. So that's why in Lord Chaitanya, all of the manifestations of all of the incarnations are personally present. <coughs> Therefore, Lord Vishnu is present in the body of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to kill the demonic mentality, not to kill the demons. The demons were killed when he, when Vishnu appeared within the body of Lord Krishna in that incarnation. And it says here, the killing of the demons is secondary work. I shall now speak of the main reason for the Lord's incarnations. The Lord's desire to appear was born of two reasons. He wanted to taste the sweet essence of the mellows of love of God. So Krishna is a person and he wants to taste that happiness that he has given to everyone else. This is a nice story. It mentions that this is in the Chaitanya Mangala. So Rukmini, this principal queen of Krishna, she's with him in Dwarka and she's massaging his feet. And in a very lovingly, in a very emotional way, she's massaging his feet. And she's crying simultaneously while she's, because she's feeling so much love for the Lord in the process of serving the Lord by massaging his feet. And she's overwhelmed with that love. And finally, she expresses something. The, Krishna, he's Dwarka there, she's the king of Dwarka. And so she said, my dear Lord, you don't know how wonderful your lotus feet are. And then she repeats it over and over again. So Krishna is listening and he's thinking, hmm, I don't know one, how wonderful I am. <laughs> Sometimes we think like that. I'm really wonderful and I have to show it to others on how wonderful I am. And therefore, just give me a little time and I'll show you. <laughs> that's the, that's the re perverted reflection of that same desire. <laughs> because we are part and parcel of Krishna, so we also want to be wonderful and also be appraised and appreciated by others. That's the material energy. But of course, because we're not qualified, it's pretense. <laughs> we're not really wonderful. <laughs> we think we are. 
we can do wonderful things. And sometimes people wonder, what the hell is he doing? <laughs> <laughs> so that's another kind of wonder. <laughs> but that's not wonderful, that's just wonder. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Lord Krishna is there and he's, he's thinking, oh, how wonderful I am. And uh, then Rukmini starts to really get into her expressions and she, she says, my dear Lord, there's only one person in all of existence who knows how wonderful your lotus feet are. Only one person. And that is Srimati Radharani. So the Lord is taking note of this. He's thinking, hmm. Hmm. I'm wonderful, and I don't know how wonderful I am, but somebody else does. And that person is my internal energy, Srimati Radharani. And so he's thinking, well, I want to, I have to find out how wonderful I am. And what is it about her that she sees in me that makes me so wonderful? And what is that experience she's having? in that experience of uh, experiencing my greatness or my wonder. So these are the internal reasons which will be explained also. So here it says, hmm, this is a really detail. And then he gets up into a different one. So there's three reasons why, or three internal reasons why the Lord appeared in that time. His external reasons was to reestablish religious principles, spread the glories of the holy name. And there's a third external reason, and that is to satisfy the Supreme Personality of Godhead who manifested prior to him, Sri Advaita Charya. Advaita Charya is Vishnu Tattva. He is a combination of Mahavishnu and Sadashiva, the original Shiva, together in one, who manifests the external energy when the new creation is about to appear. So that manifestation appeared before. Advaita Charya is 52 years older than Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So in that, uh, now he is there in Navadweep. And during that time in Navadweep, people were very, very intelligent, highly qualified, very scholastically astute, very, they could quote scriptures. But there was a lot of material desires and material opulences there. And people wanted to get more and more of the material opulences. So what did they were doing? They were worshiping demigods. And how were they worshiping demigods? They were creating forms of the demigods out of various materials, establishing worship, worshiping those demigods for material benefits. What are the material benefits? Rupam Dehi, Yeso Dehi, Janam Dehi, Danam Dehi, Dehi. Dehi means give me. Give me wealth. Give me followers. Give me a nice position in the world. Give me fame. Give me wealth. We said that. Give me some nice partner in life. <laughs> so people worship like that. I remember I was <clears throat> in London. You heard of the place, right? Yeah, everybody know? Or, yeah. Okay. I'm just, just checking to make sure everybody's awake here. <laughs> okay. So you're so I was in London and I was driving with some person, one person was telling me it was one lady. She went to the temple and she uh she wanted to worship the Lord. So she came before the deities. They have Sita Ram, Lakshman, Hanuman, Shishi, Radha Gokula, Nanda, Shishi, Gauranitai, 
And there's also uh, Ram Shalagram Shiva there. <clears throat> so she went very serious in a very prayerful mood. And she said, my dear Lord, my son is going to school, university, and he has 10 subject matters. Please give him 10 A's. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. <laughs> so that was her prayer. So, after some time, graduation came and university class was finished for the semester. And so she came back before the Lord and said, my dear Lord, you didn't hear my prayer. I asked for 10 A's for my son. You only gave nine. What happened? Yeso dehi, janam dehi, rupam dehi, vijanam dehi, dehi. We don't approach the Lord for anything. We only ask one thing. And Prabhupada told us that. How can I serve you? That is the only prayer the devotee makes. If you need something in this world, Krishna will provide it. If it's to help you to live in this world, it's to help you to engage in devotional service. He'll give it to you. But only if you engage in devotional service. If you simply try to make a deal with him and ask for the material things, He'll just send you to the demigods, that's all. Because <laughs> that's not his program. He's not there to fulfill material desires. He's there to accept our loving worship in the form of glorific glorification of him and serving him in different ways. And that is our success in life. We want other things. People come, even in Krishna consciousness, we come for... Well, we might, you know, women sometimes come to get a nice husband and, uh, you know, men want to come to get a nice job in the world. So they know the Lord is powerful. He's the all supreme controller. And so well, why waste time trying to endeavor for it? Just ask God for it. And he can give it to you right away. But he doesn't do that unless it's good for your devotional service. If he sees your material desire will help you progress in your material, in your devotional service, he may do that. And he does that sometimes just to help you become more situated in Krishna consciousness. But if he gives it and then he sees you're becoming less enthusiastic because now you've achieved something material and you're more happy with that, then he takes it away. That's his special mercy. <laughs> So we only approach the Lord for one thing. Uh, Prabhupada would always say, I only ask my spiritual master one question. How can I serve you? <clears throat> and when I saw him the second time, Prabhupada said, I never had too many, only 10 times that I see my spiritual master. And when I saw him just before he left, I asked him again, how can I serve you? And he gave me the same ex message he gave me. He said, you know, take this Krishna consciousness, this Sanatan Dharma to the Western world and preach it in English. So I got the same instruction in 1922 and in 1936, 14 years apart. <clears throat> and so Prabhupada said, you know, everything was clear. He understood what he should do. So that's what we want. We want to understand what, how we can serve the Lord according to his desire, which comes through the spiritual master and the spiritual master's representative. If we make that desire our, what is called, our focus, in other words, it becomes our one-pointed focus in life, then, then everything becomes wonderful. And even if you have material desires, they become automatically fulfilled. There's two ways to fulfill material desires. One is you try to achieve what you want and you get it, and that's a fulfillment. 
And the second one is that you get something better and you forget about those material desires. <laughs> so that's Krishna consciousness. Is it? What is that verse? Hmm. Hmm. 259 in Bhagavad Gita. Who knows the first word? Visayan Vini, no? Is it Visayan Vini Vartante? Niharasya Dehina? Raso Varjam Raso Pyasvyad Param Drisva Nivartante. That everyone needs taste because we can't live without taste. There has to be some happiness, some satisfaction, some sweetness. But that sweetness is that as long as we are still chasing after material desires, you can't capture that real sweetness in Krishna consciousness. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu knows that. So he's come and he's made it really easy. <laughs> really easy. And therefore he says to chant Hare Krishna, dance. And that's what he did. You can see. Udilu Aruna Goda Nabaji Dvijamani Goda Amani Jagi. It's a beautiful song. We would sing it every morning when we first joined the Hare Krishna movement. That was part of the morning program. And it talks about Lord Chaitanya leaving his residence and going out to the village with his associates and just chanting and dancing and waking everyone up from their slumber and then just uh, and inspiring everyone because anyone who saw Lord Chaitanya, their whole life was changed. <laughs> what quality that he had that was so outstanding that their whole minds would become inspired by happiness, simply by seeing him. And that was his beauty. He was called Gora Sunda. He's Radharani and Krishna in one. So can you, we can't imagine what that beauty looks like. I mean, it's there in front of us on the altar, but it takes, you know, Premanjri tam bhakti vilochanena Santa Sadaiva Ridayesha Viloka Yamti Yam Shama Sundar Chinta Guna Sarupa Govindam Adipurusham Tamam. In other words, when he when you have affection, love for the Lord, then you can see the Lord. <laughs> and then he reveals himself more and more and more. But still, even though we may have not attained that level of devotion, still we can see, oh, he is so beautiful. <laughs> He makes everything beautiful in connection to whatever else is in his association. There was one devotee, and someone had knitted outfits for his deity of Gornitai and Jagannath Baladev Subhadra. So they gave it to him as a gift, and he's looking at it, and he's thinking, there's a temple president in America. He's looking at it, and he's thinking, not so nice. I'm not going to put it on the Lord. But then he thought, well, they went to the trouble of making this outfit, so I should have put it on at least once. So he did. So he arranged and they dressed the deities with this outfit. And then he, he told me this personally. He said, when I saw the outfit on the deities, I said, wow, it looks really beautiful. <laughs> so, yeah, anything in connection to something beautiful also becomes beautiful. They say the sky becomes beautiful because of the presence of the full moon. A woman becomes beautiful when she's with a qualified husband. So beauty in relationship to something wonderful is also beautiful. Like that. So, yeah, so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Golda Sunda. And his color is like molten gold. Hemanga, it's called. Manga, it's like that gold. It's like if you go to uh, you go to Mayapur and you see Panchatattva on the altar, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and you see Lord Nityananda, Advaita, Gadadhar, and Srivas, huge deities of the Lord, right? So beautiful. If you haven't been to Mayapur, please don't let this life slide by. If when you see Mahaprabhu in Mayapur, you'll just surrender immediately. <laughs> you won't even think about surrendering, it'll just happen. 
so powerful, but he's so beautiful. And there's five different, there's three, there's five deities, but there's three different colors of gold that are standing in front of you. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is pure molten gold, the most beautiful shining gold, along with Gadadhar. They are the same. Srivas and Gadar and, uh, and Advaita are gold with a whitish tinge within that gold. And unique, but Nityananda is unique. He's unique. He's reddish gold. You can see it. There's, there's a red tinge within his gold. So, although it's you all look at it, you see how oh, it's all golden. But actually, if you look close, you'll see. It's very easy to notice that the colors are slightly different according to the different moods that they display. So Mahaprabhu, he descended. And he performed the Sankirtan movement, chanting and dancing and dancing and chanting and 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 chanting and dancing and chanting and dancing and dancing and chanting and dancing and dancing and chanting and dancing and dancing and chanting and chanting more. So that's our that's our program. Of course, we have to say, we have to give credit to this wonderful temple here in Ljubljana. There's so much emphasis on Kirtan and Harina. And that's what makes the temple wonderful. And that's why there's many devotees coming. There's many people coming for the programs. As soon as you have, the more you have Kirtan, the more you glorify the Lord with Kirtan, and you arrange for these things, then people will come. The Lord will invite them to come. They'll say, the Lord will say in their heart, Hey, you want to have a nice time? Here, come. <laughs> he speaks. Even when we preach, we don't say any, we say something to someone and we think, Oh, what I'm saying is going to convince them. But Krishna's in the heart and saying, Listen to him, will you? <laughs> and then they take, then they take, or he says, Well, You're not ready now, so don't listen. <laughs> he gives both. <laughs> or he might say different things. So he's in the heart of all living entities. So when we uh, when we propagate the chanting and dancing, and Lord Chaitanya, he did that. I mean, he's been in the house of Sri Vas Thakur every night. And he said to his devotees, he said, you know, every day we're going out in the out in the villages and chanting and dancing. But what are we doing at night? We're sleeping. So, let's begin Nam Nagar Sankirtan in the house of Sri Vastakur. Every night we'll start at seven o'clock in the evening and we'll go all the way to sunrise in the morning. So, the devotees got fired up, <clears throat> but the Lord made it a little exclusive. He said, only those devotees who are situated on the, the level of pure devotion can attend this kirtan, because Mahaprabhu is in the ecstasy of his own self. As it's mentioned, the three internal reasons, what are those three internal reasons? Is that he can, from the position of Srimati Radharani, which is his mood, because he has her mood and he has her color. She's Gorangi and he is Goranga. So he has her mood, so he's exhibiting that color and her, her mood of devotion. But what is that mood? And that the happiness that she's feeling in relationship to serving him or being with him. He's tasting that same happiness that she's tasting in his own form as Krishna, but in her mood as being the internal aspect of himself, within himself as Srimati Radharani. So as Radharani, he, he's experiencing what is about him that is so wonderful? What is the happiness that she's experiencing and what is the love that is the manifestation of that happiness? So that's the three internal reasons. 
So it's said that when the time for those three internal reasons to manifest, the Lord came. It says that the Yuga Dharma, which was the chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, was secondary. That was the second reason he came. He came to experience Radharani's love for himself. So we understand that God is, he is what we call, what is that? Rasavaisa. He is the supreme manifestation of all sweetness and happiness. And he has a desire to taste that. Why does he want everyone to become Krishna conscious? Well, there's two reasons. One is because he knows it's this is the only thing that's going to make you happy. <laughs> he knows that. He says, the, your only success in life is to worship him in devotion. He knows that because he's God. But the second reason is he wants to exchange love with each and every soul. Because each and every soul is individual. Just like in this material world, you see there's no two people alike. Even if you get identical twins, there are you'll find some distinction somewhere between those two people. Nobody has the same voice, sound. Nobody has the same fingerprints. There's no two snowflakes that are the same. There's no two leaves on any trees anywhere that are the same. So there's uniqueness in even in variety within the material world. So that uniqueness and variety is an, is an extension of the uniqueness and variety in the spiritual world. So each soul, although each, each one is a soul, pure soul, which is such even under Vigraha, each soul has a special, special, unique quality that's distinct from all other souls. And they're unlimited souls. So Krishna wants to taste that. <laughs> he wants to taste your love. That's it. That's why he's called. Sometimes he's called the God of Love, because when he he stands with his flute and he's got his fingers like this. This is a mudra. He holds his flute and he has the other hand like this. This this means this this is a mudra means I love you. He's actually attracting us. The sound of his flute, which is the loving call. Because if you hear his flute, somebody asked me, uh, <clears throat> somebody asked me the other day, it was just a ridiculous statement, but anyway, I get these kind of questions sometimes. <laughs> um, when I play the flute, is it like Krishna's flute? <laughs> I said, if you heard Krishna's flute, you wouldn't be alive. You'd be, you know, unconscious. <laughs> it's not, nobody can play the flute like Krishna. Because not only does he play such sweet, melodious sounds, but he's calling you at the same time through those sounds. So there's an attractive feature that comes with that sound vibration. He's inviting all of us to come back to him in loving devotional service through the sound of his flute. And that's why he has this mudra, you know, like this, you know, which means I love you. In other words, I'm here. So he comes in the form of the deity. Of course, he comes in many forms of himself. But he, when he displays his deity form, he exhibits many of his wonderful qualities, such as quality of beauty, his quality of mercy, his quality of, you know, his all attractive feature. So Lord Chaitanya said to his associates, <clears throat> let's have kirtan. So they made a rule. Only the most advanced persons could come to this kirtan. Only those who were situated in pure love of God. Mukunda would sing. And, and uh, who else would sing? Uh, sometimes the Dwaita Charya would sing. And the Lord would dance. And as soon as the kirtan started... Of course, Mukunda used to sing so beautifully. The Lord would immediately dance. So there was no one else allowed in the house. And Srivas was told, 
to make sure no one else came in who were not allowed, who were not up to the standard. So one time, one young Brahmin, he came and he said, Srivas, I heard that the that uh, you know Chaitanya is here and he's dancing in ecstasy and and uh, he's like an incarnation of God. I heard some from other people. I want to see his dancing. Shriva said, "Wow, that's impossible." But I'm very I'm a, I'm a brahmachari. I'm simple. I drink only milk, nothing else. That's all I take every day, just milk. And I read the scriptures. Can I come? <laughs> he was trying to, you know, use his, some persuasion. So Srivast thought, oh, he is a nice devotee. He's very humble. And he drinks only milk. It means he's really austere. <laughs> So you can come, but you have to hide. <clears throat> because if Mahaprabhu sees you, you'll become very unhappy. So he came into the house, Srivas hide it, hid him. And so Mukunda starts to sing, the Lord starts to dance, and then the Lord stops <clears throat> immediately after a few moments. And he goes to Srivas, hey Srivas, I'm not feeling my normal ecstasy. Is there someone here that doesn't supposed to be here? Now think about this statement. Someone who has another energy is making a difference in the Lord's pure energy. Right? So what is the Lord actually teaching us? That when we're together as a group, we all should be doing the same thing in the same mood. Because if we have individual consciousness that we're thinking about this and we're thinking about that and the kirtan's going on, you're pulling that energy of the kirtan down slowly. Not, it's not, it's, sometimes it's imperceptible, but when the kirtan really blazes, then, then it's unaffected. But in general, therefore it says that one should keep consciousness focused on Krishna on the holy name, on the activities that we're performing. When everyone's of one mindset, then that whole spiritual energy just goes up. And everyone feels happy and peaceful because everyone is within that energy. And so Mahaprabhu said, well, Srivas, is there somebody here that's not supposed to be here? Well, my dear Lord, since you asked, there was one young boy. He's very simple and he drinks. Get him out of here immediately. <clears throat> and then the boy, <clears throat> he came out and he fell at the feet of Lord Chaitanya. <clears throat> and then he got up and he offered nice obeisances. And the Lord says, who do you think you are? <laughs> who do you think you can come here and just, you know, just because you drink milk, you think you're advanced. No milk drinkers allowed. <laughs> and so you start chastising him in different ways. And then the boy, you know, was he was just very humble. He didn't respond, didn't try to make excuses, didn't try to say anything. He just listened to the chastisement. And the Lord... It was finished, the boy turned around and started walking out. But the Lord can understand, the boy was really, really humble. And he took everything that the Lord gave him. So the Lord was pleased with that. So he called him back. <laughs> he called him back, and the boy came back, and then the boy paid his obeisances again. The Lord said that, <coughs> you know, what is this idea of drinking milk? <laughs> Because, you know, Lord Chaitanya, you know, just like, just like maybe if every day all we did was drink milk, we wouldn't have any people in our temple, you know. But we got nice, you know, it's kacharis, samosas, and sabjis, and curries, and pizza, and so many things. Getting you ready for the, the fast, right? Okay. <laughs> And so, 
So yeah, so he, he said, but you can come and you can you can come and you can associate. So the Lord actually allowed him to associate and gave him his mercy. Why? Because he was humble. He was humble. So that is a quality that attracts the Lord. Although he was being chastised, he didn't protest. He didn't make excuses. He didn't try to say, well, you know, you know, he didn't even say why he wanted to come. But later on, he said, it was nice. I saw the Lord's dancing for a little while. <laughs> so he was happy. So the Lord showed his mercy. Another time, Kirtan was there, and Srivas Thakur's mother-in-law, she wanted to see the Kirtan, so she hid behind a big earthen pot in the house just to hear the Kirtan and see Lord Chaitanya dance. So when Lord Chaitanya started to dance again, immediately he had stopped, called Srivas. He said, Srivas, there's somebody here who doesn't belong here. My dear Lord, what do you mean this room? Only your devotees are here. No, no, I don't feel my natural happiness. Somebody's here. Go look. And he looked and behind an earthen pot there was there was the mother-in-law. We have nothing against mother-in-laws. <laughs> <laughs> and so Sri Vastakor grabbed his mother-in-law and very you know, what we say, not forcefully, but very without deviation, immediately escorted her out <laughs> out of the place. And then the Lord began his kirtan again. <clears throat> Another time, the Lord was there, and uh, Srivas Thakur had a little son. He was four years old. He was his youngest son. And it was another part of the house where the residents of the house would stay. And the boy was there with the, with the family members. And the boy was very sick. So after some time, uh, the residents of the house, the mother and uh, some of the other ladies, they started to cry. And their crying caught the attention of Srivas. And Srivas came back and said, Why are you crying? Why are you making so much sound? You're disturbing Lord Chaitanya's kirtan. Your son died. My son died? That's okay. But don't make, don't cry so loud. If you have to cry, cry softly. <laughs> That's how much he was dedicated to the happiness of Lord Chaitanya. So he went back. And then the Lord performed his kirtan. And seven and a half hours later, Lord Chaitanya stopped. And he said, Srivas. I feel there's some calamity in this house. Sripa said, my dear Lord, when you're here, how could there be any calamity? But since you asked, <laughs> my son died. Your son died? Really? When? Oh, about seven and a half hours. Take me, take me to him. So he went back, and the boy was laying on the bed, and the relatives were still mourning disappearance of the boy. And the Lord went right over. The Lord has a big hand. His hand is huge. I mean, the Lord was two meters tall. He was big. He wasn't a small person. He was like two meters, seven feet high. And he put his hand on the chest of the boy, and he said, my dear son of Srivas, where did you go? <laughs> and then the boy sat up, came back to life. He looked around. He said, my dear Lord, I am your servant. I'm your eternal servant. My time in this body is up according to your uh, order, and therefore I'm going on to my next destination. And everybody saw, and they listened to that, and they heard this boy speaking eternal religious principles, that the soul is eternal, and when it leaves the body, it goes to another destination. Of course, that destination is according to the karma of the activities of the soul's activity in that particular body. So, and then the boy looked around and then he just went back down and he died again. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone was pacified somewhat because they saw that actually that, that is the reality of life. That we have a body 
but we exist within the body. We are pure spiritual energy. And at one time, we'll have to leave this body. But the important, important part of life is what are you going to do before you leave? Are you going to waste time trying to make a nice material arrangement in this world <clears throat> that will be finished in due course of time, even maybe finished even before the, the time is up? Don't waste time trying to make because every material arrangement we make in this world is subject to the time factor. And it's never up to the standard that we want anyway. People have so many strong desires to achieve things in life. And when they get it, it becomes a disappointment because it, sometimes it becomes the source of their anxiety. Just like it, there's a statistic in America where there's this thing called lottery. I don't think you have it in your country. I don't know, some places in Europe they do have. So you go in, you pay, you give like one dollar or something and you get a little ticket and then they draw. If you win, you win millions of dollars. So they had a survey, they were following up on all of the people who had won the lottery for many, many years. And some of these lotteries, you get $5 million, $8 million, huge amounts of money. And the statistics show that most of the people, practically all of them, their life turned miserable after winning the money. People tried to kill them to get the money. <laughs> Relatives stole the money. People became their friend all of a sudden <laughs> to get them. And they they used the money to get drunk, to, to, to get, and they uh, got sick because of using their money in the wrong way. Their lives went down. So you would think, oh, wow, I got a large amount of money. Life is happy. I'm successful. But money is two things. It's like it can bring success. Or it can bring, you know, misery, suffering. Everything in the material world is like that. Never, nothing in this material world is absolute. There is absolute suffering. That's there for sure. <laughs> There's absolute suffering. But nothing in the material world can actually give absolute happiness. Or, let me say, sustained happiness. It's just the way it is. So... Therefore, it says, why waste time trying to chase after these things? But if you catch Krishna's lotus feet and devotion, then you're on your way to eternal happiness and perfection. Even in this life, worship of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he gives instant ecstasy through the, through the kirtan movement and through devotion to him. He protects his devotees. He cares for his devotees. He's very personal. Mahaprabhu is very, very personal. He becomes very much a part of a devotee's life. And those who focus their devotion on Mahaprabhu, just like, what was his name? Prabodhananda Saraswati. He writes, maybe you read some of his writings, he glorifies, he mentions the other incarnations of the Lord, and he says, not interested. <laughs> I'm only interested in one. And this one is the best of all, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He just glorifies Lord Chaitanya over and over again. Not interested in Vishnu, not interested in Narayan, not interested in this. Like, yeah, they're, they're nice, they're powerful, it's okay. Yeah, but Mahaprabhu, yeah. That's where my heart is, yeah. So those who actually become, we'll say, Gaur Bhaktas, you know, they experience transcendental happiness always. Because Gaur Bhakta leads to Krishna Bhakta. Because he is Krishna. Yeah. And he teaches the Muda Vrindavan through the Sankirtan movement. Because the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is the Muda Vrindavan. It's the mood of Vrindavan. Golokera, Pramadan Harinam, Shankirtan, Ratin Jan Milo Kani Upai. That chanting of the holy name is coming from Vrindavan itself. It says in the spiritual world, all talking is singing, all walking is dancing, and the constant sound is Krishna's sweet, melodious flute. 
So we can't imagine what the spiritual world is like, but it's available through Mahaprabhu, not before in any other incarnation. Only Mahaprabhu opened up the door to the spiritual world, Golokumrita, before in any of the other manifestations of the different yugas and the different <clears throat> incarnations, you could only achieve Vaikuntha. You couldn't achieve Goloka Vrindavan. Only Mahaprabhu opens that door. So he's that's why he's called magnanimous. And not only his magnanimity is allowing Vrindavan to be accessible, but he's allowing anyone and everyone. In other words, it's not restricted. You don't have to be a Brahmin. You don't have to be intelligent. You don't have to be beautiful. You don't have to take birth in a highly qualified family. You don't have to be wealthy. You don't have to have a position anywhere. You just have to chant Hare Krishna and have faith that this chanting is everything that you need for, for perfection in life. And it is. It's, it's a fact. And Lord Caitanya made his movement three things. He didn't say just chant. He said, he said three things. What is the other two? Associate with and serve Vaishnavas. Not just associate with, but find opportunities to serve the Vaishnavas. Those who serve the Vaishnavas can chant the holy names of the Lord. They can relish the holy name. If we're not serving Vaishnavas or not trying to serve Vaishnavas, it becomes very difficult to get them to taste the sweetness of Krishna's holy name. Because the Vaishnavas are very dear to the Lord. And therefore, when we, when we please the Vaishnavas, we please the Lord perfectly. So he said, Vaishnav Seva, Nam Ruchi. And then the last one, which is an extension of Vaishnav Seva, Jiva Doya, which means... Give this mercy to those who need it. In other words, preach Krishna consciousness. So that's Mahaprabhu's three-point program. That's Bhakti Vinod Thakur mentions that in one of his songs. Nam Ruchi, Vaishnav Seva, Jiva Doya. Jiva Doya means being merciful to those who are in the material clutches of Maya. Try to drag them out and bring them to Krishna consciousness. And it says, it says, only the great souls, the great souls will only be fully happy when they see the whole world Krishna conscious. Only then will they be fully happy. They're not happy simply because, they are happy because of their own spiritual, you know, strength, power. But because they are by nature compassionate, and their happiness is, 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 understood by him when they see others become Krishna conscious. That's their happiness. They get more happiness to see others become Krishna consciousness than they do for themselves. That is their greatest joy in life. And that's why they come. They come on behalf of the Lord to spread the glories of the Lord to the conditioned souls. So the most powerful way is two things, book distribution, and chanting Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And we do that here. And the success has been great because of that. But continue, because the world is still a mess. <laughs> it's becoming more and more messy. And because people are lost, they don't know which way to turn. Even their material plans are no longer something they look forward to anymore. And that's, that's been destroyed within the last couple of years. And as Prabhupada said, the whole Western civilization for the last 200, 200 to 300 years has simply made the world miserable. And so, simply made the world miserable. And so I mean, now it's becoming really miserable. <laughs> Even the basic necessities of life are becoming hard to attain. And that's, that's Kali Yuga. But that's a whole different subject. But if we worship Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and serve his devotees and think of ways to give Krishna consciousness to others, book distribution is one of the powerful, most powerful and direct way. And Prabhupada says, the best form of preaching is distribute my books. 
He made that distinction between all forms of preaching. He said, what would your three minute lecture do? <laughs> but if you somebody gets a book, then they're on their way and they get into their, their life. I mean, we have so many stories of people's lives being even immediately changed by receiving you know, a book. So book distribution is, is the force behind our Sankirtan movement. Therefore, Prabhupada emphasized these two things, Harinam and book distribution. And then guess what? He emphasized book distribution over Harinam. He made that more important. Why? Because he knew that for some people they can't understand this chanting. Of course, we do it and purify the atmosphere. But if they get a book, even if they... In, in Germany, he wrote a letter to the German devotees in 1977, May 6th. You can read that letter. It's a beautiful letter. He's talking to the German book distributors. He says, if a person buys a book, they become benefited. If they see the book, if they, no, if they buy the book, they become benefit. If they read the book, they become benefit. If they see the book, they become benefit. If they simply touch the book, it's in the letter, you can read it, they become benefited. Because these books are incarnations of the Lord's special mercy in, in literary sound vibration. So if we emphasize these two things, and we're doing that as much as we can, and, uh, then gradually the world will change. And then, of course, Prabhupada's other program is establish these farm communities. Because as the cities crumble, as Prabhupada says, these cities will crumble. We need to live in such a way as that we can further our Krishna consciousness. Live like Krishna lived. Natural living, simple living, cow protection, agriculture, farm communities, healthy lifestyle. He said, and he said, we'll be preaching in the cities and inviting people to come to the farms. That was Prabhupada's program. And it's happening already, so you can see. So Mahaprabhu is that force that's bringing it all about. So we worship Mahaprabhu by chanting his holy name, by associating with and serving his devotees, and taking his message, because he writes, you know, he doesn't write, he speaks in the in the ninth chapter of this Adi Leela. He says, I am a gardener. This is Mahaprabhu speaking. I'm a gardener. And I have this storehouse full of wonderful, succulent, juicy, tasty fruits. They're so sweet. And I am tasting these fruits. I'm becoming nourished and so happy. But I want to distribute these fruits to everyone. So please help me. He said, I'm only one person. He says that. I'm only one person. How much can I do? But I have a whole storehouse full. And what is that fruit? The fruit of love of God. So take it and distribute it. <laughs> and make other people benefit, you know, happy. And by doing that, then Mahaprabhu becomes your personal possession. <laughs> he becomes very inclined to that devotee. So this is Mahaprabhu's movement. It's rare, comes once in every thousand yuga cycles. That means it comes once in 8 billion, 640 million years. He doesn't, after this particular Kali Yuga, Lord Chaitanya doesn't come for another thousand Kali Yugas. Neither does Krishna. Now you can see, oh, how you think, wow, I'm here, alive, during Mahaprabhu's era. How fortunate. People in previous ages didn't have that fortune. They had to do really, perform really austere austerities to become Krishna conscious. Real austerities. Austerities that would be impossible for people in Kali Yuga to perform. Well, that's Mahaprabhu. He's cut away all of this. Chant, dance, 
take prasadam and associate with the devotees and spread this mercy to others. Simple. Very simple. Any questions? Yes, uh, Prabhu. All right. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful letters. I read them. My question is regarding the service, the serving devotees. What topic should be those services? How to serve the devotees? You have to. Building for them, or it should be connected to Chaitanya mission, or something like this. More in this way. Well, out of all of the three, I would say all of the three. <laughs> <laughs> and whatever else you name, include it. <laughs> so what does that mean? That there's varieties of ways you can serve the devotees. So the scriptures give six ways. <laughs> Uh, one is to speak some confidential thoughts to another devotee. In other words, speak something Krishna conscious to another devotee. Another one is to give a gift to a devotee. And another one is to give prasadam to a devotee. These are the three recommended ways, and the receivers are the recipients, and then the other three. So there's, it's mentioned in Nectar Instructions, verse number four, six loving exchanges between devotees. So you just see. If you can hold the door open for a devotee, if you see a devotee needs some money and they're struggling because they have, give them some money if you have it, if you can spare it. If you have some time, spend some time with a devotee. Maybe a devotee needs to speak with somebody. They're undergoing a little difficulty. So we can think of different ways, just like people in the material world do that. They open hospitals, they open food centers, they... They distribute clothing. They do all kinds of things to help others. We can do similar things, but we have to see what is the need. So uh, the best thing to do is tell another devotee about Krishna. That's a wonderful way to serve a devotee, because then you're sharing Krishna together. Give, them, give another person a book. That's a, a nice way. It's a gift. Find out their birthday, buy something on their birthday. <laughs> or just because, you know, there's one girl, she's in the Tenfer Temple in Denver. She's a Pujari. She's my age. She's quite elderly. And she gets the Mahaprasadam, and then throughout the day she goes around meeting different devotees, and she just gives out the Mahaprasadam. She'll carry some small books, and she'll give them out. She just thinks of ways to serve the devotee. And everybody knows, oh, here comes Mother Nidra again. She's coming out. She's going to give me something. <laughs> They're always, she's always thinking how to serve the devotees. And when somebody tries to give her seven, she says, oh, thank you. You keep it. <laughs> she doesn't ask for anything. So, yeah, she's, so her mind is like that. It's just throughout the day, she's just thinking how to do something nice for someone and make them happy. So we can do that with devotees. There's hundreds of ways. You just have to see what would be appropriate. That's all. Because I think is, is it also okay if sometimes you decide it and say that you cannot serve the devotee in something maybe that he asked you? We try, but if someone asks you to do something you can't do it, think about who else could do it for that devotee. Don't say, no, I can't do it. Think, oh, they have some requests. Maybe I can't do it myself, but I can arrange someone to do it. I can think of where they can go and get that same desire fulfilled. That way you don't say no. Thank you. No. Thank you. 
And oh, Mark and Dave had a question, yeah. Yes, uh, thank you. Regarding that point that you mentioned that the other incarnations, regarding that point that you mentioned that other incarnations did not open the way to go up, just change the world. By, by well, Krishna came, but Krishna comes and then Mahaprabhu follows him. He also comes once in every thousand yuga cycles. I'm curious how to understand that regarding the, the point that I think it's in the it's the, it's in the chant canto where it said that the gopis, one of the groups of the gopis who meant uh, Lord Ramachandra is expressing Rishi, Rishi Chari gopis. Yes, yes. So how could we understand that? In one sense, you know, Well, they prayed to Lord Ramachandra to become gopis, right? And they got their desire fulfilled. So what is the question? Well, it's maybe maybe a little bit technical, but the, the statement is that other incarnations did not open the way to Goloka, oh, just oh. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And, and this, at least that's the one that I can think of where it's not... Specifically, exactly, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, but in one way, they, he. Well, they had to qualify. It's not that they just became gopis because they prayed. <laughs> you just can't become a gopi just because you want to become a gopi. <laughs> you have to have qualify yourself to come to that standard of what what it means to practice gopi bhav. <laughs> so they had they had that feelings of what we say, uh, <clears throat> loving affection for Rama, Lord Ramachandra, but they were in male bodies. So they had that same, what we call, uh, Madhurya affection. So therefore they prayed to the Lord to become gopi so they could exchange that loving affection. But Ramachandra can't, exchange with gopis <laughs> at least he doesn't do that so ultimately they had to come to Vrinda, to qualify themselves to become gopis in Vrindavan so it's not something that came automatically they had to leave that body and then become gopis <laughs> so Lord Shri Chandra, Lord Ramachandra gave him the, the blessings and permission but they had to qualify themselves Just like us, we still have, before we get the blessings and mercy, we have to still qualify ourselves to make, to come to the certain stages of spiritual attainment. The mercy is there. When you get the mercy, it becomes easier. So Ram, obviously Ram gave their mercy. Is that okay? Okay, thank you. We have one of the ladies on this side. We got Hector. Thanks, George. Um, earlier you were talking about um, Krishna Bhakti as a uh, demand and surrender. And you were saying Lord Chaitanya has made it uh, more simple. I was wondering if you could elaborate, because in one sense it could feel like Lord Chaitanya is also demand and surrender, like chant. Um, Thank you. Yeah, because when you chant, then you will surrender. But Krishna says, first surrender. <laughs> then you give my mercy. Lord Chaitanya said, here, take the mercy. Sing, dance. <laughs> you like to sing, you go to the nightclub, you get drunk. Yeah, just care. Sing, sing the names of God. It's nice. So he made... He made it like spiritual entertainment. Really? Just like when we were out on, we were in Denver, Colorado, we were out on Harinam on New Year's Eve, you know, like the coldest time of the year. So, and so we went out on New Year's to do Harinam. And people in America, they're all getting out, they're in their nightclubs, they're roaming the streets, and they're half intoxicated. So, 
So we were out there and we attracted some of the locals to join our cure town. So it's on film, you can even see it. So the devotees are dancing and chanting and two guys are there, and one guy is. So one guy is uh, saying to his friend, what are they singing? And the other guy says, I don't know, but it's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, they're on their way. <laughs> Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, and there's many incidents like that, yeah. I told that story, I think I told it the other day, when that one lady. Did I tell it last night too? When the Ratha Yatra and in London, Kripa Moya was singing, and uh, it was, you know, we had huge Ratha Yatra. It's one of the biggest Ratha Yatras in, in ISKCON every year. This year is July 30th, if you want to mark your calendars. And uh, so he was singing, and one lady, she come running from the side, just some onlooker, and she's, she's crying. She goes up right up to Kripa Moya. What are you singing? What are you singing? I can't stop crying. What is that? <laughs> yeah. She, she didn't know what it was, but she was just, you know, experiencing that act. Yeah, so that's the holy name. If the heart is in the right position, then the emotions are, will become explosive. When the heart is in the right position, then the mind is receptive, and then all of a sudden you can experience something wonderful. Uh, we'll come back to you. Okay. We got one from your partner. RJ, yeah. Uh, just a quick question for me. I, I did not download the, the internal reasons why Mahaburu came here. Uh, the three internal reasons? To taste the love that Radharani, to understand the love that Radharani has for him, to experience the happiness she experienced in that love, that's two, and what are the qualities that are about him that attracts her? <laughs> what, what is the nature of her love? What is the happiness she experiences in that love? And what is the qualities about him that, her, that attracts her? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, Am, Amrit, Am, Amritananda? Mahatmananda, okay. There's a lot of Anandas nowadays. <laughs> um, regarding this uh, internal reason of Chaitanya, so I wonder what happened, or could it be that Shimatra Nami is asking the same question? What is the experience that Krishna is experiencing experience about him? What is that love? So you, you're doing a little improvisation here. Yes, I was wondering. <laughs> it's called philosophical speculation on the absolute truth, following in the footsteps of Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur, who takes the situation and pre presents a scenario that's not actually happening. But it could happen if you understand all of the dy dynamics that are, surround that situation. That's called improvisation. So we can speculate what was, will Radharani think? What is it about me that attracts Krishna? That's your question. Is Radharani thinking like that? But there's no statements regarding that that are within the Shastras. All they know that they 
they try to make themselves attracted to Krishna. They present themselves very nicely. They try to dress nicely. They try to sing nicely for Krishna so he'll be pleased. They do things for Krishna that will attract Krishna towards them. So all of their qualities, and along with many, most of their activities, is to somehow attract Krishna. But what, but in essence, what does attract Krishna to Radharani is that her love is the most pure. So what is that love? Is that there's not a slight trace of personal desire in her love. The gopis will do anything to please Krishna. Anything. They'll even give up their life if that pleases Krishna. <laughs> They'll do anything. But Radharani's love is a perfection of that complete selflessness. But what about, oh yeah, okay. Radharani knows Krishna. Just like if you want to have a loving relationship with someone, you should know about them. You should know their qualities, their nature, what makes them happy. What, what is it about them that will, that's something you can do to please them? So Krishna, Radharani knows Krishna perfectly. She knows his heart. She knows everything about him. No one else does. Only her. Because, and because of that knowledge of Krishna, she knows exactly how to please him. So think about that. Even in the material world, the more you know about someone, the more you can understand how to build that relationship based on the knowledge of that person. People get attracted by physical attraction, but that doesn't mean you know much about them. Physically, it's like in a material world, people get physically attracted, and then they get married, and they start learning about each other, and then they think, uh-oh, where's the divorce papers? <laughs> yeah, they don't get to know each other. That's why I'm getting to... So Radharani... She knows Krishna perfectly. She knows his heart. She knows everything. She knows even how to get angry at Krishna, which makes him happy. She gets angry at Krishna. She rejects Krishna. She doesn't want to talk to Krishna, but it gives Krishna great pleasure. Because everybody likes him. So here's somebody that doesn't like him. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> from the external point of view, he's, he's showing some discord in that relationship. But that discord, because it's based on love, it's the highest form of expression of loving relationship. That's so why, just like in Vrindavan, next to Sriji Mandir, there's another Mandir. It's called Man Mandir. Man means anger. When Radhi Rani became angry with Krishna, they actually built a, a temple based on her loving anger. <laughs> so, yeah. So she knows Krishna perfectly. And that's why Krishna is attracted to her more than anything, because she knows his heart no one can know the heart of Krishna, it's not possible. Or even the mind of Krishna. The Radharani does. And she's always trying to satisfy Krishna. So that's that's the attractive force. So Krishna is attracted to Radharani, and Radharani always knows that her whole mood is to attract Krishna. Therefore, that's why that's why. She knows she's the best of all the gopis. Because all the gopis assist her, the manjaris assist her in helping bring about relationships with Krishna. 
Why? Because no one can please Krishna better than Radharani. So the gopis are helping Krishna, Radharani come to Krishna. Although many of them want to be with Krishna themselves, still they know that Krishna is more pleased with Radharani, so therefore they say, they they push Radharani forward because she's the best. <laughs> I mean, sometimes a man has three or four wives, but then he has one favorite wife. It's always like that. You have so many friends, but you have one favorite friend. You have so many things you like to eat, but there's one that's the best. And so in all categories, there's something that's outstanding. Out of all the flowers, Prabhupada said the rose is the most, is the most attractive. Oh, Radharani is the best of all the gopis. But does she think, oh, what was your question again? <laughs> does she think when it is from Krishna that, she, that he experiences about me, that he sees, he's so attracted about me? What's well, that? Yeah, she she knows that, and therefore she tries to make that more attractive. But if she thinks, just like in the Rasa dance, when Radharani started to think that Krishna loves me more than anybody, and I'm the best, he left. Yeah, he was with all the gopis and Radharani, and then Radharani left. And Krishna went out chasing after Radharani and left all the other gopis. But then when he found Radharani, he put her on her shoulder and they were playing together. He was running through the forest. And then she started thinking, ah, Krishna likes me, loves me the best. And then Krishna understood her mind. So he went under a, he ran under a low hanging branch. And she, in order not to get hit with the branch, she grabbed onto the branch and Krishna kept running. And she was left hanging on the branch. <laughs> but Krishna plays tricks on her also, you know. So, so when she becomes proud of her exalted love for him, then Krishna will do something. So she avoids that. <laughs> That's one incident. Yeah, you can read that. Okay? Tough question. You are a follower of Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, who likes to improvise different situations to make the sweetness even more sweeter. Okay. Question number two. Um, you mentioned that. Where you mentioned that um, the read the internal reasons for why um, Lord Chaitanya appeared is because Krishna couldn't understand Radharani. But if Radharani is, is Krishna's internal potency, how do we understand that Krishna doesn't understand his internal potency? Another, another guy like her. You know, so <laughs> how can how Krishna cannot understand his own internal potency? It's her love. So he wants to experience that love. And the happiness that is the nature of that love. So he wants that experience. He can't experience that from his position. He may understand it, but he wants that experience. That's why he becomes Mahaprabhu. <clears throat> he wants to see life from her position. Although he knows everything, the experience is unique to the individual. <clears throat> Krishna can experience what you're experiencing, but 
if he really wants to experience it, he becomes that person. And then the experience is perfect. So he wanted to experience that love and what is the nature of it. And what is it about her that attracts him? So he wanted that experience. Probably makes that point, yeah. Okay. You remember the soul is still distinct. It's unique. Anything else? Okay, there's no breakfast. But we can, uh, you going out in Harinam today? No? Okay. What's the next activity? Is there a, a group activity coming up? Hmm? Kirtan's here. Oh, okay, great. Fantastic. Okay, and then tonight I think there's an evening program starting at 4 30. Yeah. So Kirtan up until 4 30, and then 4 30 there's Abhishek, then there's a drama, and then there's Another class, Palananda Maharaj and me again. <laughs> I love to speak, but you guys need some variety. <laughs> uh, yeah, and what else? And then, then there's Archie after that. And then there's that thing that everybody's counting the minutes for. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu ki, Sri Gaur Purnima ki, Srila Prabhupada ki, Nitai Gaur Premanandai.